All right. I think the curve is flattening. So um, it's my pleasure to welcome everybody to the 14th session, as it were, of the webinar series on ETS for policy practitioners, which is a webinar series that has been hosted by the International Carbon Action Partnership, or ICAP, with support from the European Commission and jointly implemented by Ecologic Institute, get to see and ICF. I'm Michael Meeling, um, Deputy Director of the MIT Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research and a Professor of Law at the University of Strathclyde. And I'm very pleased to be moderating today's session, which is titled Emissions Trading in a Context of High Energy Prices. I don't think I have to really explain the timeliness and importance of this topic. Now, one of the big macroeconomic trends in, in the last months, of course, has been this dramatic surge in prices of commodities and energy, which comes on top of an already increasing carbon price over the last several years um, and is, of course, raising certain concerns and discussions about potential need for policy intervention. And that, of course, makes it important to understand the drivers behind these price increases, what policy solutions could address if at all, some of the causes behind that and what side effects both intended and unintended such policy interventions might have. And we'll have a tremendous panel to um, highlight or to shine light on various different aspects of the topic. But before I get to introduce them, I'll just give a few housekeeping remarks on how we'll handle this webinar. So first of all, just a sort of disclosure that the session is being recorded. So we make these sessions once recorded available on the project website. And I think Johnny will be copying the link to the project website in the chat in a moment. He's helping in the background. So the whole architecture of the webinar is being handled by him. Um, thank you, Johnny. And you find there not only recordings of past webinars, it's a growing repository, if you like, of BTS knowledge, but also announcements and links to upcoming um, events including in-person events. And we were just discussing with um, Joostel Baker, one of the panelists, that there is a chance that we might be holding the first in-person training course again later this year. If so, there will be announcements on the website. Second, um, the flow of the session, it's a 90 minute session, and it'll first start with an introductory presentation and then two discussants will sort of comment on and add their own perspectives during the first half roughly of the webinar. Then we want to open up for Q and A with the audience for the remainder for the balance of these 90 minutes. And to take part in the discussion, and I'll repeat these instructions later when we get to that point, but still um, I'd ask you to post questions using the Q and A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, there's a Q and A button. There is also chat, obviously, but we prefer to focus it on one of the windows so I don't get confused when I'm trying to moderate and make sure that I'm monitoring all the questions that are coming in. And as I said, I'll repeat the instructions again later. Before we get to the panelists, we have had a tradition in this webinar series, as well as some of the other ICAP ETS capacity building activities um, of having a poll at the outset a quick interactive poll with a tool called Mentimeter. Johnny has just posted the link in the chat and it helps us kind of set the scene and get a sense of where attendees stand, how they interpret, how they understand the topic and how they would potentially answer some of the relevant questions. And that's useful for the panelists later. They can refer back to that. And you know, it's, it, it, it's a good way to set the, the stage for the discussion. So if you click on the link in the chat, or go to menti.com and enter the code that is in the chat, you'll see that there is a first question that has popped up. And it's about whether or not you think it's desirable to have a high carbon price with a number of reasons that you could cite in, in defense or in justification of that. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm starting to see answers flooding in. We'll, we'll wait a little bit till we have, say, a bit over a dozen of um, answers to see where the, where the audience sort of falls on this set of questions. Is it desirable to have a high carbon price? And if so, what are the rationales behind that? All right, the number of answers is starting to grow. Seems that the favorite is that we need a high carbon price when it's high enough at least to incentivize low carbon investments. But there's a few others. One that's kind of counter to that, if the cap is being achieved, then the price should be as low as possible. 
following the rationale of an ETS as a tool for least cost target achievement, if you like. And I also see that the third one, well, the one at the bottom to the level, the, the level of the carbon price is irrelevant. It's all about reaching the target and the price is sort of secondary. It just does what it does. All right. Well, I think, you know, with about half of the audience's answers in, it seems like clearly there is a sense that a carbon price does have to have a certain level. Um, it has to be high enough to simulate, stimulate investment decisions or to channel and, and, and catalyze investment decisions in a certain direction to lead to process optimization, behavioral change, et cetera, fuel switching and so on. But also several of you felt that there are other reasons why it could be high or lower. Maybe it doesn't matter so much. Let's go to the next question. The second question, which is probably even more germane to today's session's topic. In times of high fossil fuel prices, should governments and countries with significant carbon prices intervene to ease costs for final consumers? And there's four options, two yes and two no, but with slightly different reasons behind them. One rationale, yes, to avoid distributional impacts. The other one, well, if high energy prices already achieve some of the effects that the carbon price has to normally achieve, we don't need it. But then clearly the majority of answers are going to the no. First of all, not to intervene because it would undermine the political credibility, a strong argument for sure. But the one that's gathering the most um, votes is clearly should not be lowered because the social hardship, the distributional impacts can be addressed through other policies in a better, more effective, more targeted way. Okay, thank you very much for participating in this Mentimeter poll. I think it sort of already introduces some of the themes that we will be discussing in the, in the session. And that is where I finally get to introduce our panelists. That's the highlight for me as a moderator, of course. So um, we will get, as I mentioned, an introductory presentation today by uh, Jostin Christensen. He's a partner with Oxera, which is an economics and finance consultancy with offices in a number of countries around the world. But I believe from your signature that you're based in London, is that correct? All right, fantastic to have you with us. Thank you very much. And I'll briefly also introduce the discussants already before handing over to you, Jostin, for the introductory presentation. So Jostin comes from analysis, understands the market, understands the drivers and the fundamentals in the market. He's really somebody who, who works the whole day and uh, parsing out and, and decomposing sort of these complex interactions. We have as a discussant, Jost Delbekim, who's currently a professor and the EIB climate chair at the European University Institute in beautiful Florence in Italy. But I think many of us, of course, came to know Jost as uh, the, at the end, Director General of uh, the Directorate General of Climate Action in the European Commission. And really, if anybody can be called the architect of the EU ETS, which is still one of the largest and certainly the first multinational um, emissions trading system for greenhouse gas emissions. It is yours who is really, I think, left a, a, a stamp of a fingerprint on carbon markets like no other person. So not only do you bring now the luxury of sort of the detached academic perspective, you can speak more freely, but you bring also this decades of experience working in the political, in the policy making and political um, um, setting and having to deal with those realities is of course also something which is really important for the discussion. And finally, and I'm also really happy to welcome as the second discussant, Maureen Lee. Um, she's in a similar, I'd say, segment as Joostin, so a consultant and market researcher and an analyst at EcoEye Company, which is an offset provider, trader and market analysis firm based in Seoul in Korea. But what's really important is that you bring the perspective of one of the many countries currently developing emissions trading systems in an emerging economy. If we look around the world, Southeast Asia, Latin America, even Africa, the socioeconomic realities are of course different in many of these countries that are now beginning to explore or set up emissions trading systems. And that is something that you might be more familiar with than those of us sort of in Europe or North America, who again, had a very different fundamental 
um, landscape, if you like, when our emissions trading systems were set up. So I couldn't think of a better set of panels to guide us through today's questions and to address them from, from various important angles. Thank you again, all of you for joining us. And as mentioned, I'll start by inviting Jostein uh, to provide us with your introductory presentation, which I think you'll be sharing with us. The virtual floor is yours, Jostein. Thank you very much, um, Michael. So I believe I'm sharing my screens now. So if, if that's going well, then I'll proceed. Thank you very much to, uh, to yourself, Michael, and the organizers at ICAP for giving me the opportunity to kick off this session. Uh, I'll offer a few thoughts on what has recently been going on uh, in the European carbon market with a particular focus on the recent surge in commodity prices and what this implies then for markets and policy going forward. Um, I should say that uh, the outset of this presentation is draws heavily on uh, an Oxera study that we published earlier in February, which focused on the drivers and trends of EU carbon trading and uh, which was supported by ICE. So uh, the interest in the functioning of the commodity and carbon markets, notably also in the European Union, has been driven by sustained increases in prices seen since you know, the start of the pandemic, really. For, for example, in 2019, which is, I guess, is the last full somewhat normal year before the pandemic, uh, the EU uh, carbon price was trading around 25 euros per ton. Natural gas were, in the European Union was trading at around five US dollars per MMBTU, and the key benchmarks for crude were around uh, 65 US dollars a barrel. But by Q1 2022, uh, carbon was trading at just over 90 euros a ton, so an increase of four times, uh, approximately. Natural gas was around 27 US dollars per MMBTU, uh, an increase of around five times. And crude oil was around 94 US dollars per barrel, so an increase of around one and a half times. And it's worth pointing out now at this stage that the chart on the slide uh, shows the price movements relative to the average 2019 prices for these commodities. Um, and uh, this helps to show the, the increases in, in multiples, let's say, that we've seen recently. And I should add also that uh, without doing this kind of uh, augmentation, that uh, actually some of these prices would have quite literally been off the charts. So uh, it's, a, it's a useful way of seeing the, the prices these days. But now, alongside these uh, price surges, we have seen that other commodities have also followed these trends. So carbon has tracked the gas price, something that I'll discuss in more detail in a moment. Fertilizer prices have also closely followed natural gas prices, which obviously is a key input into fertilizer production. And food, as well as metals and minerals prices, have closely tracked crude oil prices, reflecting the impact of oil and transportation costs. Now, coming back to carbon prices, it's important to note that uh, 2021 was an eventful year in terms of uh, European climate policy. For, in particular, the Fit for 55 package was published in July, and it uh, increased the ambition for emission reductions by 2030. So this had an impact on, on prices. Um, the um, uh, Essentially, the Fit for 55 package uh, included uh, measures such as you know, higher annual emission reductions, phasing out of free allowances progressively, and, in, and strengthening the market stability reserve to absorb, but also ultimately retire excess EU allowances. And together, these policies had the effect of then reducing the expected supply of allowances in the market over the long term. Separately, there was a dramatic increase in gas prices. As I discussed, the LNG market was tighter than expected. Uh, and there was a much greater uncertainty over the continuity of Russian gas supplies, um, something that uh, Europe is still suffering. Uh, and the increase in the carbon prices coincided also with the loosening of COVID pandemic measures. And this economic recovery that resulted then re gave rise to greater demand for energy. And this kind of created a kind of mutually reinforcing set of drivers that drove carbon prices higher. So to get taken together, these developments then had the effect of also increasing the expected demand for allowances. And with price movements looking as dramatic as they do, for example, on the chart here, uh, it's inevitable perhaps that uh, concerns are then raised over the impacts you know, of these prices on the cost of living, inflation, and also the integrity of markets. However, our study uh, that I referred to earlier has indicated that markets have largely reflected market fundamentals 
And uh, in respect of carbon prices, those remaining at around about 80 euros per ton, uh, these uh, are broadly aligned with forecasters' views of prices that ultimately are necessary to meet the European Union's emission reduction targets. So as summarized on this slide, European uh, or EU carbon prices are, uh, as with many carbon prices in markets elsewhere, are affected by policies that ultimately are aimed at limiting over time the quantity of greenhouse gas emissions. The, the cost of reducing those emissions and the commodity prices such as gas and coal also play a key role in determining carbon prices very often. Uh, provided that uh, the emitters themselves believe that uh, policy targets are credible and that policymakers are committed to reducing emissions over time, then you would expect them to act to reduce their emissions since the EU ETS then is designed to allow the carbon price to adjust to ensure that the efficient measures are made economically viable. And so in the short term, emitters can then reduce emissions by switching to using fuels that emit less and by improving their energy efficiency. Uh, and those industries that then are exposed to competition from outside of the EU uh, can then also be affected by hard, high carbon prices uh, by, let's say, increasing imports of goods and materials into the EU and then displacing domestic EU production. And while this carbon leakage reduces EU emissions, it doesn't necessarily reduce global emissions. And so therefore, and also it has adverse effects on the EU economy. And addressing this is currently one of the priorities of the European Commission as regards climate policy as well. In the long term, emitters can reduce emissions by investing in new technologies and processes. And the key policy challenge here is therefore to ensure that the ETS, the EU ETS, provides sufficient long-term incentives to enable this investment to take place. Exchanges, uh, so markets, uh, are therefore uh, have an important role to play in ensuring that uh, liquid, resilient, and competitive markets uh, are present so that carbon trading can take place and then when so that risks can also be hedged, facilitating investment also. Uh, the EU ETS is designed clearly to target greenhouse, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions directly um, while allowing prices to rise to levels, the levels necessary to meet that objective. But commodity prices and other market drivers will also affect um, these prices in the short and long term. So this slide then shows how commodity prices can have a significant effect on carbon prices in the short term. Given that the combustion of fuels for electricity and heat production uh, account for 60% or more of the emissions covered by the ETS, the fact that the uh, emission intensity of coal and gas fire generate differ substantially means that this is also then a driver of overall emissions and ultimately the, the prices. The illustration on the right-hand side um, of the slide is showing how switching between coal and gas-fired power generation is incentivized in the electricity market. And in general, if the carbon price increases, then coal generation is reduced, leading to overall lower emissions, which then in turn enables the carbon market to reach a lower clearing price. But fuel switching also depends uh, on a range of other things, uh, for example, the levels of coal and gas prices. And as discussed earlier, the gas price increased around five times during the pandemic uh, compared to 2019 levels, and the carbon price increased around four times, but the coal price didn't increase by anything like as much in the same period. So the next slide is gonna show the implications of this. So this slide is then showing the evolution of the carbon price during the pandemic and the implied carbon price above which the market would incentivize a switch away from coal and instead use gas to generate electricity. The dark blue line being the carbon price and the lighter blue line, the one with the dramatic upward turn is then this break even price, which then reflects the technical and economic parameters for representative coal and gas plants, as well as the higher gas price relative to the coal price that existed at uh, over time. And the implication of this is that in the second half of 2021, EUA prices would have had to be over 200 euros per ton to reduce coal fire generation. 
uh, to incentivize coal, uh, re um, reductions in coal-fired generation. And given that carbon prices did not get anywhere close to this level, explains why um, even record high carbon prices did not reduce power sector emissions to the extent that otherwise would have been expected. Now, this somewhat counterintuitive market outcome can be explained by market fundamentals, which I've discussed here. And the carbon market has uh, functioned more or less as it was designed to do with prices broadly reflecting supply and demand. But clearly the high carbon and gas prices that we're experiencing continue to adversely affect consumers and households. So the fact that the EU carbon market continues to function well can be seen in the trends in the number and diversity of traders active on the market. One of the, uh, actually one of the key concerns that has been raised recently is that the growing number of financial institutions active in the EU carbon market has led to excessive speculation. However, this slide shows that the overall number of positions held um, by financial institutions has broadly remained constant since 2018. The chart on the right-hand side is showing that financial institutions generally take the short positions as they are the counterparties to the long positions of non-financial compliance entities and commercial organizations who hedge their price risks in the market using various derivatives. And financial institutions are therefore essential to ensuring liquidity in the carbon market since they enable trading, hedging, risk management, and so forth. Now, this slide shows the concentration of traders' net positions in the carbon market and how that was lower uh, in the carbon market than for other derivatives, where, again, uh, a majority of financial institutions are, are also active. While the concentration in many derivative markets is lower than the thresholds typically used by regulators to identify uh, the risks of market manipulation, the carbon market has actually the lowest concentration of the markets shown here. And a low concentration is significant since it indicates that the carbon market is uh, more likely to be resilient in the face of external shocks. The, the risk is therefore that prices are being affected by, uh, the risk is therefore low that the um, uh, uh, that prices are being driven by manipulative strategies aimed at, you know, cornering the market or squeezing the holders of the short positions and such like. So overall, uh, this also highlights, you know, some of the benefits of uh, EU carbon uh, market design as well. And finally, a, a key finding that we also had in our study was that the increase in the number of traders active in the carbon futures market has also coincided with increased liquidity as measured by the uh, relative bid-ask spread. So as the number and diversity of the firms active in the market grew, the cost of carbon trading has also fallen. And this is then consistent with there being a greater number of financial institutions driving more competition in activities such as market making and liquidity provision. And by providing this liquidity, um, financial institutions then help to improve price formation and, and risk sharing. Now, uh, a major trend that uh, we've seen uh, in the EU car market has been the shift from trading EUA derivatives over the counter to uh, exchange trading, as the exchange traders have then invested to attract more market participants and thereby improve um, market liquidity overall. So for example, in 2007, the market was roughly a third OTC and a third on exchange. And in 2021, we see that uh, the market is around three quarters on exchange and only about a quarter OTC. And this has then led to a number of uh, positive benefits uh, to end users. In particular, exchange trading as highlighted in the, slides, in the slide, um, exchange trading leads to lower barriers to entry for new trading participants. Uh, improved transparency, for example, and uh, as I mentioned before, competition for li in, in the provision of liquidity and market making services. And as carbon trading matures in the future, and as the carbon markets become more established, it's perhaps likely that this trend seen in the European Union will also uh, take, take hold elsewhere where it's given the chance to. So finally, I want to briefly 
um, touch on some of the implications for climate policy uh, of the surge in prices that we've seen in, in the last couple of years. So firstly, while our study has shown that the EU ETS is broadly functioning well, there is a need for ongoing market monitoring. Uh, on the one hand, it's uh, clearly important to protect customers or sorry, consumers and households by ensuring that uh, prices are not unnecessarily high, but it's also important for prices to reflect fundamentals to ensure that the EU ETS uh, is able to provide a robust price signal to incentivize switching to cleaner fuels, um, energy efficiency measures, and, and investment in green technologies, as well as um, enabling, of course, hedging and investment. Now, the, the carbon price that we see today uh, is broadly consistent, uh, as I mentioned, with the aims of EU climate policy insofar as the price remains within the range that's expected to be necessary for the EU to meet its net zero targets. But that said, enhanced monitoring of the market is also warranted due to the increased uncertainty over policies, um, there being increasing ambition and also uh, a number of new policy mechanisms being introduced. And uh, the deployment also of new technologies and commodity prices is these developments are also um, to a degree uncertain, uh, as is, of course, the uh, increasing investor interest in carbon market returns. So all of these sort of factors come together to, I think, uh, in, in our view, to still require regulatory authorities to be monitoring the market diligently to identify uh, uh, risks of you know, market manipulation, excessive speculation, and so forth. Second, it's vital that um, long-term price signals are established to enable front-loading of investment in clean technologies as much as possible, so that carbon price spikes in the short term are averted and the costs of meeting uh, the net zero targets uh, is kept as low as possible. One of the schemes that has been proposed in the EU to, um, to achieve this is to deploy carbon, so-called carbon contracts for differences, CCFDs. These uh, would be long-term contracts that uh, would ideally also be competitively tendered to ensure that the overall cost um, is low and that the design of the contracts uh, is such that the carbon, that if the carbon price is higher, then the additional cost to households would also be lower. Oxera actually has been involved in the design and assessment of these kinds of market mechanisms in the past. And our experience is that the key issues that still need to be addressed in respect of the introduction of CCFDs would be things like the um, coming to a, a, a conclusion on the sort of tender specification. So what is the product being auctioned? Um, how is the auction going to be run? How is it going to be designed? and also ensuring a degree of technological neutrality to improve competition between different projects to get the overall costs down to increase competitive pressure and also designing some uh, appropriate uncertainty mechanisms because obviously uh, as one introduces new mechanisms in a new context then the potential is there for market outcomes to be uh, to some extent unexpected and having means to address that is uh, it will be important and finally, given that greenhouse gas emission, um, greenhouse gas removals are increasingly likely uh, to be required to keep global warming to get materially below two degrees C, it's also important that the design of carbon, mar carbon markets are reformed uh, to enable negative emission technologies, whether nature or engineering based, to be integrated into the carbon pricing system. This is a topic that uh, has been analyzed actually in a separate Oxera report, and um, it's clear that integrating these technologies can help improve efficiency and reduce the costs of, ener of the energy transition long term. And so with that, I, I'll conclude my uh, presentation and uh, thank you for your attention and I look forward to our discussion. Perfect. Joostin, thank you very much. If, if you allow, I'll quickly, uh, there's a clarification question that I think we can still quickly fit in because we were well within the time um, we'd allotted for the introduction. That's aside from the European Energy Exchange and the ICE now in Amsterdam, any other main exchanges for EUAs since you mentioned the dramatic growth in exchange-based trading? 
So there is a degree of uh, exchange rate training, I think, on EEX, for example, who is also the um, uh, the organizer of the of the actual auctions of the e-ways themselves. Um, and some of the other exchange operators also will uh, will no doubt be be, uh, be trading EUAs or derivatives of the EUAs rather, uh, and also uh, let's say potentially instruments related to potentially other carbon markets as well. I'll hold the second question that popped up because that's already a much deeper one, and we'll talk about that I think in the discussion. And I understand that maybe even yours you will actually address it in your discussion remarks so i'll hand over to to yours to sort of react to your students uh, presentation but also comment on some of the ongoing policy debates around this thank you well thank you uh, michael and uh, thank you justin for a very interesting report uh, the issue of high carbon prices is an important one and i'm coming back at the end because uh, you know, the polling that you were doing at the beginning, you know, needs uh, or provokes some thoughts uh, and, and comments also from my side. Um, now, out of the excellent analysis of Justin, um, I would like to take out, you know, four or five elements that really provoke attention. Um, the first is about fuel switching. Uh, the success of the EU EGS has been based over more than a decade on successful uh, fuel switching uh, between coal or away from coal towards the use of natural gas. And given the very high gas prices today, that fuel switching has become problematic. So even if we have today very high carbon prices, the efficiency of the carbon market is much less compared to what it was in the past, because that easy, if I, I may use that word, that easy fuel switching uh, away from coal towards gas has come to an end because of the very high natural gas prices. I think Justin was uh, indicating that. The war was, of course, a very important element, but even before the war, there was already nervousness on uh, carbon markets. And so I think that is um, quite problematic uh, because the, the low cost options that normally are you know, uh, mobilized through the carbon market have come to an end. And we are now looking for a world in which much more expensive carbon reductions are in the target. Um, the hard to abate sectors, the industrial sectors are coming to the fore. Removals uh, were mentioned by, um, by Justin, but I think that's uh, very important to note that, you know, we have come to an end of natural gas as the bridging fuel for the low carbon transition. And we feel that in the carbon market. In the past, the fuel switching happened, you know, very efficiently between 30 and, 50, uh, 30 and 50 euros uh, per ton of carbon, roughly. Uh, we can debate about the precise figures. Um, but today, as Justin was uh, indicating, we are talking about a necessary carbon price of more than 200 euros. Uh, per ton of carbon, and that is a problematic price level as we see it today. So my first point is the fuel switching, which was the uh, very efficient way of reducing carbon in uh, Europe, has come to an end. And that is quite historical and uh, will provoke uh, uh, more analysis and more policy questions from the policy field. And you know, we have very ambitious climate targets under the ETS only, uh, the commission proposed that we would reduce by 2030 the emissions by 61% based on 2005. Now we are today at around 45%. You know, we can discuss the details, but we are far away from the 61%. And so in the remaining seven, eight years uh, that are in front of us, this is really challenging because the cheap option switching away from coal to gas has come to an end. My second point is also building further on Justin's um, uh, analysis, and that is that we need the financial intermediaries in the market because they uh, create liquidity, uh, they are providing uh, useful hedging positions to the compliance markets and the compliance operators. So, uh, we, uh, hard, we hardly disagree on that element, 
We have been making the point also to other compliance markets, including the Chinese, who are, you know, uh, doubting whether they should go for allowing um, the financial intermediaries to play a role. And we have been very, you know, convincing, I hope, uh, to say they are playing a useful role. But, but there is still a problem at hand, because in some of our member states where uh, the um, questions related to the functioning of the EU ETS is much less enthusiastic than in others, you know, people have been saying, are these high carbon prices not the result of speculation, of illegal speculation, of irregular speculation? How difficult that may be to define, but that is an element in the political debate, in particular in Poland, uh, you know, where coal-fired power generation is very uh, important still. The gas prices and the, and the high uh, uh, price environment on energy markets has been spilling over through the carbon price into the prices for electricity. And so there is a social dimension that is being addressed there. And uh, that is an important question. Let's face up to it. It is an important question. Now, in the buildup of the EU ETS, we made uh, a quite of silent, but still a very important decision. That is that the EU ETS would fall under the um, regulation of the financial markets. You know, in the beginning, that was not the case. The ETS was seen as an environmental measure. But when we saw the ETS growing, we needed to um, have discipline on that market and a financial, you know, uh, and, and, and a regulator overseeing the market. And so we made the decision that the EU ETS would fall under the regulations for financial markets. And so it was obvious that uh, this question of whether there is speculation, illegal speculation, yes or no, was submitted to the financial regulator. And the financial regulator was making a report, ESMA. That report is very recent. It's only a couple of months ago. And that report came largely to the conclusions that Justin has been uh, elaborating. Namely, the market is not subject to irregular speculation. It is behaving like another financial market. It's very similar. And uh, the statistics that Justin was indicating uh, plead for that. And so, um, you know, the market is driven by the fundamentals. And the fundamental thing that is regulating the market is the very challenging targets that have been adopted through the political level for 2030, also for 2050, but in particular for 2030. And the credibility that has been you know, put on the policymaker to make this happen you know, is reflected in the carbon price. The target is ambitious, so the prices are going to be higher because the um, moving and removing carbon is subject to high cost increases higher cost increases and squeezing out those higher cost options is what needs to be done. So um, all is good. You know, the uh, financial regulator said, you know, the market is healthy, but still there was a warning, uh, a cautious element that was raised. We should do much better monitoring and reporting of the market because this uh, need for market oversight was um, or is up for improvement in the EU uh, because uh, you know uh, the financial uh, supervisor has so many markets to supervise and uh, so far the carbon market was not subject of priority attention and that I think is now going to happen. Now despite all that we have negotiations in council and parliament and in particular in the parliament where the ETS is up for review a very important position was taken by the lead department, the Environment Committee, and the Environment Committee voted for explicit holding limits on financial intermediaries. So that has sparked quite a little bit of debate. It's uh, you know up for um, the regulator to see whether they are going to uphold that position. In my humble view, it's less likely that this will prevail, but there is a chance that it could prevail. And so the developments that we are going to see in the coming months are going to be very important because this environment committee 
of the European Parliament still needs to be taken on by the plenary of the European Parliament. And after that, the European Parliament has to go into negotiations with the European Council, which is the member states. And so it's not yet the end of the story. This is an unfolding uh, uh, negotiation that in, you know, I don't know when it's going to uh, um, come to an end, but easily can take us another six to 12 months before we come to the finalization of that negotiation. But still, the point is, the financial operator said, ESMA, that the market is driven by fundamentals, but the political or part of the political players are not convinced of that. And they want to have controls. And that is now subject of the negotiations in council and parliament. So more is going to come, more heated debates, more work for Justin and others, you know, to prove whether the market is healthy or not. Um, I was in the um, European Climate Summit where the market traders were coming together last week in Barcelona, and that was one of the talks of the, of the town by way of speaking, whether this holding limits or this questions related to the role of the financial intermediaries would be translated into law, yes or no. So that's my second point. No uh, problem now, but, you know, let's watch out what the regulator is going to do. My third point on the price, um, uh, on the carbon price, is the very recent developments in the European context. Uh, the Repower EU plan that the European Commission was advancing, you know, uh, develops a strategy to become more independent from Russian coal, Russian oil, and Russian gas. And so um, uh, a whole plan was developed. It's going to have billions, hundreds of billions of investments required to make Europe independent from Russian oil and gas in particular. And uh, that needs a financing. And uh, the European Commission was shuffling around some of the funds that were not used, but the only new source of fresh funding for this policy plan came from the EU ETS. Because the EU ETS, we have been talking about high prices. What is the flip side of the high prices? That is that the revenues from the carbon market have also increased with a factor four, five, compared to 2017, a factor almost of 10. So the revenues are more important. So the policymaker has noticed that there is money in the EU ETS. And so the proposal was made that 250 million allowances would be taken out of the ETS and more specifically out of the market stability reserve would be brought to the market in order to raise 20 billion euros to diversify Europe away from the dependence of Russian oil and gas. Now, that's quite a move. We never saw a similar thing because basically, um, we never looked attentively to the revenues. The revenues were going to the member states and we asked the member states to spend those revenues in climate related policies, but there was never a hard check on that. But now the revenues, part of it, would be taken off by the European Commission and used for diversification away from Russian oil and gas. And you know, the war in Europe is really, you know, hitting the minds of the people, of all people, of the entire society, not least of the political uh, um, uh, class. Now, what is the impact of this? Because the green side of the equation has been saying, but hang on, you are taking out allowances and then you bring them to the market. So that is going to dilute the overall climate ambition. Now, I have to disagree with that because the climate ambition is expressed in terms of a target that is legally binding for 2030. And by 2030, that effect is going to be leveled out and that target is going to prevail, which is 61% lower in 2030 compared to 2005. So there is not going to be an environmental impact, a climate, a greenhouse gas emissions impact. What we are going to see is that we are going to see a leveling out of the effort over the entire period. In fact, the Commission had proposed to do more at the beginning of the period and less at the end of the period. And now we are seeing a de facto leveling out of the effort in 
equal annual tranches. So the result would be delivered, but it would be one, two years later, by way of speaking and going a little bit, you know, on, on the edge of things. Um, but what is going to be the remaining element is that prices, carbon prices, are going to be somewhat lower compared to what market analysts had anticipated. And so um, we were close, um, uh, you know, immediately, uh, let's start there, immediately after the announcement of the measure, the prices dropped with 10, 15 euros, uh, but that was rather a surprise effect of the market. But the market recuperated from there, and we are more or less not far away from the level that we had when the measure was announced. But what we are likely going to see, and that is that many market observers were betting that the market would break through the psychological barrier of 100 euros per ton of carbon. And that will take a little bit longer. That will be rather the end of the period than say in a couple of months time. And I think that is where the market reacted. You know, they were a bit surprised, but I would uh, rather say that is a rather healthy development. And that is where in my next point, I wanted to come and react to uh, the polling that you did. Uh, is there a kind of political limit or social limit or, um, you know, a perception that there is a limit to carbon prices. And I think I would not underrate that element. You know, uh, carbon prices today in Europe are around 85 euros. They were 10 times less four or five years ago. So that has its impact also in electricity prices. That has its impact in the daily lives of people where electricity prices and gas prices are subject to quite some political debate. So what I would express without being overly academic on this is that there is somewhere a political limit to how far you can go into the carbon price development. And um, the question was raised in the polling, should governments intervene? And I would, as, a, as an academic, I would agree uh, there are social policy instruments other than the carbon market to intervene. But, you know, all these are very difficult, you know, to make them happen and take a lot of time. So that there is a temptation by the, the political level to not let the prices go through the roof, I think is a normal interest that politicians may have. And let's face it, the EU ETS was in 2005 a sideshow. It was the beginning, it was a small market, it had low prices, it was a new experiment. Today, we have a grown up policy, climate policy instrument, raising a lot of money. We are talking about hundreds of billions of, of, uh, you know, of budget that is being uh, changing hands every year. So we are talking about a grown up policy instrument that attaches and directs and attracts the attention of prime ministers and ministers of finance. So I would say we have to live with that, with both new elements. First, the fact that prices may, carbon prices may not go through the roof, even if there may be a rational for doing that, there is a kind of social psychological limit to that. And the second element of that grown up of the EU ETS in climate policy is the fact that revenues are much more important. And I think, you know, that's a comment I wanted to make, which in my final uh, comment I wanted to uh, make um, is um, what is the future going to bring? Um, I think that the future is going to bring a little bit of a moderated increase in the carbon price, but everything is hinging on the future of gas prices. And the future of gas prices depends on how the war in Ukraine basically is going. Now, the military operations may take much longer compared to what we all thought when the war was starting. And uh, in any case, in Europe, the trust in Russia as an energy trading partner has gone. The reliability of gas deliveries has gone. 
And I think that is a major change of which we have not yet thought through everything in Europe, all the implications that this is having, because let's face it, you know, we were heavily dependent on natural gas. Natural gas prices were going through the roof, but the role of natural gas as a bridging fuel comes to an end. And that is making a tremendous change in the working of the EU ETS. It makes us looking at other ways of fuel switching, not the easy one from coal to gas, but from the hard to abate sectors, from the removals and brings into the picture, now that we will have to live with high carbon prices, the whole question about international competitiveness, carbon leakage, the CBAM discussion, you know, a debate we can go in, into the discussion, but you know, it brings on the table that carbon prices in Europe and the carbon market in Europe is now a real determinant political factor when it comes to prices, when it comes to revenues, but also its place in the overall energy market and the revolution we are going through uh, in Europe now that the war in Russia has taken the turn, uh, the war in Ukraine, the Russian invasion in Ukraine has taken the turn it has taken. So I would like to limit my comments uh, to this, but uh, you know I uh, welcome very much the headlines of Justin's report, but more is going to come because of the uh, military um, uh, invasion uh, we got on the European continent, which was absolutely, you know, inattended, not foreseen, and changes the picture quite significantly also on climate policy. Thank you. Thank you, Jos. Uh, fantastic tapestry that illustrates just how complex um, emissions trading really is, especially as it becomes more mature and more central and has scaled up. In Korea, the, the emissions trading system is, is younger, but it still has quite a few years now uh, under its belt, if you like. And um, nonetheless, you know, I think many challenges will be similar. There will be parallels to what has been experienced in the EU. Some challenges will be different, of course, given the different socioeconomic context. So very happy to have, as I said earlier, when I introduced you, Maureen, you to comment on you know, how some of these concerns about rising commodity prices, but also a for an emerging economy context, always one of the more, let's say, significant carbon prices compared to other countries like, say, Mexico or China. Um, how, how has Korea navigated this? And I understand you want to share some slides. So the Zoom is entirely yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me share my slides. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Great. We can see them. And the slide deck. Yeah, you've already perfect. And I think perhaps because you're a bit further away from the microphone, if you could kindly speak up a little bit so we can, wonderful, yeah, thank I you. I have to speak a little bit louder. So yeah, again, thank you, Michael. And thank you to the whole uh, organizers, the Ecologic Institute and ICAP and the European Commission for uh, inviting EQI to this webinar as a discussant. And thank you, Justin, for your informative uh, presentation, providing an amazing insight on the implications of uh, high energy prices on carbon markets. And also to Joost for your amazing and excellent points that you have uh, shared with us. So um, uh, just as Michael said, um, I'm going to give a brief um, uh, context about what's happening with TRIA. Uh, it's quite different with what's happening in the EU right now. So let me start with my presentation. So uh, everyone knows that Korea is an export-oriented country that is highly dependent on uh, heavily heavily dependent on imported fossil fuels uh, for power generation and for manufacturing industries. So for phase three, we have this uh, 2.9 billion cap which is um, in annually distributed around 567 to 589 million tons. And basically the, uh, EU ET, uh, the 
CREA ETS is one of the core tools of the government in achieving our carbon neutrality goals as it covers um, more than 70% of the total national emissions. As you can see from this graph, allowance prices in the Korean ETS were above EUA prices in early part of 2020. Korea with the economy we have and the KETS covering most of the export industry is very um, vulnerable to changes in the global market. That is why um, when the pandemic lockdowns happened, and when the global economy slowed down, Korean industrial production also slowed and power and energy consumption decreased. This decrease led to a surplus of allowances. So uh, the Korean ETS for, for everybody's information is, has only a single year compliance here, which means compliance allowances must be surrendered either after a year or carried over to the next compliance year. So if there are remaining allowances, these allowances are to be canceled. So this is the main reason why prices fell in 2020 and 2021, as you can see on the um, dashed red circle and the star over in the middle of the graph. And um, prices recovered in late 2021 and then fell again in early 2022 due to a combination of factors like the continued oversupply of allowances and the economic uncertainty brought about by the geopolitical tensions in Europe, which affected our market sentiments. In this slide, um, it shows the price, price movements between the Korean allowances and the J Japan Korea marker LNG prices. As you can see, Korean allowance prices are pretty much not correlated with gas prices. And um, the reason is, unlike the EU ETS, the Korean ETS has, has been a compliance only market for around six years and has only allowed the participation of financial in December of last year, which means for the majority of the carbon markets implementation period, the main price driver is compliance buying. First, compliance buying. Concentrated around April to June of each compliance year. That was the last semester before the compliance surrender period visits June. Another influencing factor for the Korean ETS prices is the supply and demand. So um, the lack of liquidity normally drive prices higher, which happened in uh, for the first five years of the, K the Korean ETS, while the oversupply from the strict banking restrictions are now costing very low prices because of the possibility of allowance cancellations. So in terms of government interventions, prior prices either increase or decrease. Th that's when they come in, either to um, try to relax the prices or try to encourage the prices to go higher. So for, for, for this month, I think um, the prices were around playing around 15 to 17 euros, far below the fuel switching price of around 50 euros that were uh, previously identified by government estimates. So very low prices are not encouraging investments to low or carbon, uh, low carbon technologies. And we all know that like in the EU ETS, policies have a very direct impact on ETS as regulations set the pace and stringency of reduction. So it's also known that TRIA uh, has enacted our carbon neutrality law. We have a 2050 carbon neutrality target. And we have an NDC target of 40%, which was a, a big increase from the previous target of absolute 24.4% reduction based on 2017 levels. So you, you may ask, why, why are the ETS prices so low? That is because uh, our market is currently not reflecting the bullishness of our national policies and um, international commitments. 
because of the oversupply issues and because the full allocation for the phase three theory period, which covers 2021 to 2025, has been distributed to the companies, meaning that the NDC target of 40% is not yet reflected in the current ETS cap. So right now, um, high energy prices does, does not seem to really have a significant, significant impact on the Korean ETS as we still have a lot of coal burning. Even with the increase in coal generation, the market surplus remain, remains high and power companies can just purchase allowances in the market for cheaper prices, which does not encourage coal to gas switching. Another reason is that um, a mechanism to um, reflect carbon cost in power dispatch and electricity prices is currently non-existent. And unlike the EU ETS, we do not have speculative activities as we only have a handful of financials, which is around 20 financials who are still familiarizing themselves on the ETS market, given that they just entered like half a year ago. And also our futures market is has yet to start, which is um, we have heard that is scheduled to start probably mid early of 2023 or mid 2023. So, uh, just just to, to to end my presentation, it's 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 not to say that the public, that the Korean public and the whole Korean economy are not affected by the high energy prices. Of course, companies covered by the ETS as well as the small medium enterprises are also suffering from high prices of raw materials as well as high gas prices. And oil prices used in the transportation sector have also risen. So with the current issues that the ETS is facing right now, uh, the government is in discussion with different related agencies and the stakeholders to find viable solutions such as like tightening of the cap, which is still undecided if they're going to push through with the tightening in the current phase or they're going to do it in phase four, which starts by 2026. And also set, setting up of mechanisms to address oversupply, either um, changing their banking restriction um, calculation or totally removing the banking restrictions, we still have to find out. The new administration is also um, pursuing the increase of nuclear power generation in our energy mix. So we have to wait and see how the power mix is going to be revised by the end of 2022. But the new president is supportive of the NDC target and the carbon neutrality target. So we are expecting that there will be no major changes in sectoral targets, except for the part of having the share of nuclear and renewable energy probably switched, switched together and then related measures to support the plan. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Maureen, for this perspective from Korea, where indeed you know, the political, the policy framework is different, but also the fundamentals. Before I open for q and I'd like to give Yostin an opportunity. Formally, you know, both Yost and Maureen were discussants to you. So is there anything in their remarks that you would like to react to or respond to before we invite questions from, from the audience? I, I, I agree with the points that um, uh, Yost, uh, yes, Yost has, um, has has reason. I mean, in 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 the Korean context, say uh, first it was let me have my notes. The fuel switching, which is of course one of the major success of the EU ETS. Right now, um, we have a target of um, expanding our LNG um, capacity until twenty thirty five so that it can encourage coal to fuel switching. But with current high gas prices, there's also this kind of um, um, uncertainty because the expansion of LNG means more investment in LNG infrastructure. And then it means more risk of having high stranded assets, just like what happened to our coal investments overseas. So right now there's a huge push to do renewable energy, but 
the, since the new government administration is pushing more nuclear and trying to like decrease the share of renewable energy, that's also quite tricky for us. The next one is that the need for financial intermediaries. I agree with that. I mean, um, we need more diverse market participants to pr provide liquidity. Right now, our financials are very small. It's very limited to only Korean, Korean licensed financials. So we still do not accept uh, foreign foreign financials into the market. So there's little movement and they don't really uh, help liquidity in the market right now. It's mostly the market makers who's providing liquidity. And uh, yes, there's a political and social limit, just like what's happening right now. I mean, uh, we're supposed to be um, rising electricity prices because of rising ha uh, high energy prices. But then the government is very careful threading the balance between the public and the the, the utility uh, profits. So right now, instead of rising prices, which was um, scheduled actually last month, they have to postpone it indefinitely because they're concerned about public outrage. And uh, but every but our TEPCO, the Korean Electric Power Corporations profits their their deficit is growing and there's a there's there's studies that it may collapse just in like a few years if if we do not raise our prices so it's inevitable we expect that probably in the second uh half of this year the electricity prices will rise and then the government has to to deal with you know the social problems that will also come with it so yeah it, it is it's this this kind of um uh, process right now with um, balancing everything with the carbon prices and going what's happening with the economy, Korean economy, which is very export based. So that's, that's very, very tricky for us to, to find solutions that will really work and will really encourage more investments. Thanks for the additional insight. And I think a lot of the sentiment you just expressed is very much shared also say in, in, in Europe. But Justin, this may have given you a chance to also think if there was anything you wanted to, under no obligation, we can go to the, to the Q&A. There's a few questions in the Q&A, but still, if there's any thought you wanted to, to sort of bring in after hearing these rich um, discussant remarks. Indeed, yeah. Thank you very much to uh, Maureen and Joss as well for, for your remarks. They're very, um, very, um, very thought provoking. I think in terms of the uh, sort of my immediate reactions then would be on particularly on kind of fuel smitching and the mention of the repower EU um, measures. Clearly, this this energy crisis, this um, this uh, conflict, uh, that uh, this war that has broken out is obviously very unwelcome. And um, it is something that uh, is causing a lot of disruption, let's say, in the in the normal uh, business of, uh, you know, individuals, households, consumers, businesses, what have you. Um, and I think in terms of fuel switching, I think it's right to think, say that, um, you know, we have, you know, for the foreseeable future, the, um, uh, let's say, switching from coal to gas has you know, has run its course, and we cannot rely on that uh, more in the future. I think clearly Repower EU is designed or has promote has put forward a package of, a wide package of measures. Um, and one and two of them, I guess, you can potentially conceive of uh, some of those measures being having some sort of uh, um, uh, impact in the short term. For example, um, obviously, um, as Joss was saying, uh, the European Union cannot, let's say, rely upon uh, Russian gas supplies to anything like the same extent, if at all, in the future. Uh, and as a result, there is a, a moves afoot in order to ensure that the European Union receives, let's say, LNG supplies from stable stable trading partners in the future. And I think that um, that may take some weeks or months, but it's something that is potentially a, a, a short-term measure that, that can bring some benefit. There might be a need to expand infrastructure and, and new uh, import terminals, but nevertheless, I think there are already uh, a, a large number of terminals that are available that can provide some can alleviate the situation to some extent. Renewables as well, uh, renewable uh, generation uh, of various kinds um, can have an impact. Um, 
maybe not in the in next couple of weeks or so, uh, but rather over the scale of months and maybe a year or so, you can imagine that uh, renewable generation can be expanded relatively quickly. Um, and uh, and that's something that, uh, or fairly quickly, and there, that's something that, you know, will, will alleviate the situation as well. And I think really beyond those two options, um, there might be some smaller measures that are possible, but I think we're really looking at a situation where the European Union needs to think about the long term. And uh, if that's uh, going to include, you know, more nuclear generation, for example, uh, clearly that's something that won't be possible to be ramped up in the in the short term. That's something that takes years to achieve. Um, but also, I think developing, you know, or facilitating innovation and new technologies, new processes is absolutely critical these days. And I think if there is one silver lining to this uh, cloud, let's say, it is the fact that the carbon price, the carbon market is doing what it's supposed to do. It's reflecting overall scarcity. Prices are high, and this then becomes a mechanism to use to good effect to achieve the kind of funding uh, in the way that uh, um, Joss was highlighting. I would only say that uh, in addition to obviously diverting uh, EU allowances taken from the, as it were, the public bank of um, of, uh, of allowances that is the MS MSR, and using those to these purposes that Jos was talking about, I think in extraordinary times, extraordinary measures may be required. Uh, and it's not something that was contemplated before, but it's entirely, I suppose, it's it's down to policymakers and obviously the political authorities to, you know, make the judgments about you know how much. How much, uh, let's say, disruption and, and suffering, let's say, that uh, that uh, people uh, should be expected to bear, and how much of that can be otherwise defrayed from uh, by using um, by using social measures and and, and other support measures, uh, and I think ultimately, if that's uh, what the European Commission wishes to do, then I think you know it, it should go ahead and do that. But recognizing that that does introduce. Uh, maybe a little bit more uncertainty around exactly what allowances will be forthcoming and when. And this uncertainty can also, um, if not, if transparency around these measures is not uh, high, and if that's, they're not communicated well, then the risk is there that this will then undermine the integrity of the ETS and ultimately the commitment to the policy targets. So I think this measure has to be complemented by a clear long-term plan for funding new technologies and delivering the energy resources that will then make it credible in the future that this overall cap can be delivered and it will be deliverable at reasonable cost over the very long term. And I think that will be my, my, main, my main remark in relation to those comments from, from Joss. Thank you very much, Justin. And, you know, you. I think when you when you mentioned the need for sort of a predictable, transparent uh, mechanism to intervene, um, of course, it brings to mind the MSR, which prior to this political decision, at least it was very clearly set out under what rules the mechanism works. One question in the discussion, in a way, I think you're, you already answered the question, but nonetheless, maybe we can parse it out a little bit further. First of all, what you think about this political announcement, but also, a second question related to the MSR, which goes to the fundamental nature of the EU ETS, if you like, where, where the question, it's an anonymous one, but anyway, that's indeed asked, you know, if you have a mechanism that allows injecting hundreds of millions of allowances based on certain thresholds, is the system capped or not? And in a way, I think you answered it implicitly by saying, well, you have to look at the longer term kind of trajectory. But anyway, how would you or any of the panelists react to these two questions that were put in the Q&A. And to all other attendees, a reminder that, you know, please do feel free to type in your, your, your questions, also comments, um, and I'll be reflecting them in the discussion. If I can come in, uh, Michael, on, on your question, I think that the EU ETS has been shaped in such a manner that there is a hard cap in the separate periods that are there. So the period we are now in is the period 2020-2030. And in that period, there is a lot of flexibility. There is banking, which is unlimited. There is the waterbed, you know, also the free allocation is being released before the deadline for the, uh, or uh, before the uh, surrendering deadline is uh, kicking in for the past year and things like that. So there is optimization over 
that period. And I think that's a very important given. So the real cap is the cap that the legislature has adopted for 2030. Today, it is different from the one, the 61% that is being negotiated, but you know, in due time, you know, when the negotiations come to an end, that is going to be the real binding cap that is subject to the ETS. And I think that that is the, the key variable of everything. And the market stability reserve will no longer actively function by the end of the period because the oversupply that was in there will have been neutralized. And that is one of the reactions I would like to give to Maureen's um, uh, curve, you know, about the Korean price level on the carbon market. If I translate that to the European uh, level, we saw the prices going up in two, from 2017 up until 2019. That was the functioning of the market stability reserve. The oversupply of the market has been neutralized. It was not yet de facto neutralized, but the announcements was there and the market operators, you know, reacted to that. And as of 2019, there was a new e European commission who was declaring a green deal and a much tougher target for 2030. And so the fundamentals that Justin was talking about kicked in as of 2019 up until now, where the trust is there that this uh, more ambitious level is going to be delivered. And hence the prices related to that were going up. So in the price increase 2017, 2000, uh, or what we have seen up until now, the first part is the functioning of the MSR and the trust that was given that the oversupply would be taken back. And, and the, the second part was when the belief uh, in the political authorities was expressed that the new target expressed by the new European Commission would be uh, delivered on. And a final comment, if I may, on um, what Justin just said on the LNG and the renewables and the nuclear that may be developing in the new energy mix of Europe. There is one disappointing element that is already happening. And that is that there is a scramble for all energy resources that are available already there. We see the use of coal going up. And we saw that last year already, and we see that this year. And for the coming winter, we see that coal mining and lignit mining in Germany, in Poland, in Romania, in Bulgaria, you know, are up again. And that, that is a real disappointing element, you know, exceptional circumstances. If, you know, uh, Mr. Putin would turn off the gas even more, we will see the pressure on coal, you know, increasing again. And that is the, the real brutal reality we are in. We have high carbon pricing, but the emissions covered by the ETS are not going down. And that is a brutal reality that we may see for the coming six, uh, eight months until the coming winter will have come to an end. And I think that's a brutal reality and it's going to have an upward pressure, more demand for certificates that is going to be there. And for that reason, I welcome the market stability reserve operation that was done in leveling out prices because there will be, there may be an Im imminent price pressure upward from burning more coal uh, that has to be put against uh, less economic activity. I do not want to use the word recession where we don't know, you know, clearly where it is going to happen. You, so you see how the uncertainties of the situation are being translated into the carbon market price. And I would hope that it is not going to hit the psychological barrier that may paralyze our decision makers, you know, they, um, as they are in full negotiation on things like the future of ETS, the CBAM and you know, a number of other important elements that are on uh, in the negotiations between Council and Parliament today. Thank you. Your, yes, your team. Yeah, so I think just one quick reaction to that would be that, so it's important that, so this this issue around policy, the the, e, the credibility and the trust in ETS is absolutely central. The, re, the real risk at the moment is that lots of things are done uh, that then mean that there's an un, if there's uncertainty about what the long term holds, that then companies and those compliance entities that really should be, let's say, hedging themselves by buying and holding more allowances, particularly with these, these new uh, MSR uh, allowances coming in, 
if there isn't the trust in the system or if there is uncertainty about the future, they may be, re may be focusing too much on the, as it were, the short term, not keeping an eye on the long term, and then not getting themselves ready for the scarcity that's going to hit later on. And I think this is an aspect that, you know, I think there's been lots of research good research that has been done, you know, looking at, you know, the, the, the shift between allowances and the intertemporal, let's say, pricing dynamics that happen as a result of banking and MSR and so forth. And I think this is kind of one of the, one of the key things I think that uh, it's important to um, be, be aware of, that this kind of dynamic might mean that actually in the future, if the wrong people are holding too many allowances in the future because of differences in perception around risk and you know the, the time horizons over which they're making plans, I think that is something that uh, I think uh, need, needs uh, something that let's say the authorities should also be monitoring and being aware of as they as they make and communicate the policies that they are looking to implement. Thank you. Maureen, you don't want to weigh in? Then I'll go to the next question. Just making sure. All right. There is a new one that came in the, in the, in the Q&A, and it sort of relates to the policy options that policymakers have at their disposal. So you described how the EU Commission is suggesting, you know, is proposing releasing allowances from the MSR, which will also help dampen the price increase on carbon prices. Maureen mentioned how in Korea, energy price increases have been capped. And across the EU, we've seen a number of different measures taken to deal with both higher energy prices, but also less so, of course, because this is um, commission or EU prerogative with the EU ETS. Um, around the world, there have been other ways of, of also approaching this. And one thing we haven't talked about this, both in the EU and elsewhere, in the EU, we have the Social Climate Fund, which will be fed also by revenue from another ETS. And I think, and this is mentioned in the question as well, Reggie in California have also sort of advertised how they've used revenue from, the, from their respective ETSs to deal with distributional impacts, household cost increases, et cetera. Can you reflect on those? That's the question essentially, what do you th think, or can you say something about these other mechanisms that were mentioned before, but we never really went into any, any detail? Any volunteers in the panel? Well, I can uh, perhaps uh, give the, the first shot at the question. Um, yes, the social climate fund and the social, I mean, close to my psychological barrier on where the prices may go in is the social variable because we are talking about distribution effects. And um, with the current uh, energy prices uh, we are seeing on the market, we should be very wary of not having a climate policy that is socially regressive that is hitting more the poor than the rich. I think that's a very important element. And so the Social Climate Fund is a very welcome uh, you know, instrument in that respect. It is a plan to, uh, to give support to uh, refurbishing of social housing facilities and, and schools and all kinds of uh, facilities where energy efficiency improvements are you know, very much needed, but cost a lot of money and needs to be financed. And I think for that reason, that is a very useful uh, addition to, to, to the basket of policies that is accompanying the EU ETS. But already today, we are recommending to the member states to use the revenues from the normal ETS, uh, to use them as compensation for the high electricity prices that people are suffering from. Of course, it's in the hands of the member states. Some member states are doing it, some member states are not doing it. And they do it in their ways. You know, there may be handouts, there may be reductions on VAT and on excise duties. Uh, so there is less, you know, uh, EU control over this, but member states are using a significant uh, part of this revenues to dampen the social impact. Um, so I think that uh, that is a very uh, important element that, that is happening. And if I may the take the benefit of reacting also to Justin's last comment on communication and orderly, um, you know, handling in a regulatory perspective of the ETS market, that is absolutely true. I, I cannot endorse that more. I think that the Commission has already been making noises about how many allowances would be brought to the market in what time frame, year by year, et cetera, to stabilize the expectations, to undermine irregular speculation that may be fueled by one or the other uh, miscommunicated element. So I think uh, uh, the, the, the long-term 
element is going to be very important, but we should not undermine that the ad hocaries that and the long term policies as well that are working out on the energy market are very important. When I look around, uh, my friends are all talking about refurbishing their homes, about solar panels they put on their roof, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the uh, the generation of electricity, the consumption of electricity, due to the high energy prices, not the carbon policy, but uh, or not the obligation of renewables, but it is becoming beneficial to invest in the energy efficiency of your house, to put uh, solar panels on your roof, etc. You know, this is a cluster of things where it is hard to predict how that is going to influence the carbon price also in the future. So you have pressures that are driving up the carbon price, like more coal use, but you also have very immediate pressures where people are behaving, you know, according to the high energy prices. And we should encourage that. You know, uh, also, if people want to drive slower on the highway or they want to put their, you know, the heating system in their houses a little bit lower, you know, these are all elements that are directly or indirectly also uh, influencing uh, the, the carbon market. So there are so many elements, uh, but the regulator should make sure that it is not at the source of instability on the market. So that point is uh, absolutely and completely taken. Thanks. Any further reactions from the panel? Yeah, I think I think from my side, I wouldn't have any uh, specific um, uh, comments on, let's say, what is the right balance between social measures and other kind of policy measures to address the current uh, crisis. But I suppose they, but I accept that there, you know, there is a trade-off to be made. I think uh, in all, I think all the comments that I've made, it's about saying, you know, let's not have the short-term. Uh, unduly, let's say, um, undermine the long-term objective. And I think part of that is also, you know, um, uh, along the lines of what Joss is saying, you know, the communication, the transparency, the clarity with which, and the, and the reasons behind the policies that are being introduced, it's important that those are uh, communicated well. Maureen, you'd start it also. Do you still want to read? Yes, um, just uh, yes. Just going to uh, comment on the 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 question the question that was uh, raised about the social climate panels, the EU not on the EU side but on the Korea side. So, what as I've said before, the the government has tried to postpone raising the electricity prices, but it will be the the price increases will be phased in, just like three times in a year. It will be scheduled like that so that it will not be a like one one off uh rise in prices and um under our carbon neutrality law we have this so-called climate resp response fund which costs billions of korean won and that would be yeah um, millions of us dollars and that is uh basically um uh channeled to uh technological innovations and of the building of uh, clean energy facilities. But with uh, the current discussion uh, in the, we have heard many discussions about trying to reform Korea's electricity market design, which uh, would probably incorporate the cost of carbon either into the wholesale, wholesale electricity prices or allowing the ETS to impact wholesale prices. In the long term, we will probably also have that kind of social fund to help vulnerable communities adapt with um, the growing prices in commodities, energies, and carbon, things like that. Fantastic. So we're, we're at time almost. A, a last question came in, and it's a complex one, and I think it's a good one. And I'll, I'll pose it in the form of a quick poll, just a, you know, a, a five second, 10 second answer. But um, the anonymous, we have lots of anonymous questions today, is reminding us that fuel switching is, of course, the major sort of abatement option triggered by a carbon price at the price levels that we've been familiar with and, and like to see in the carbon market. But now, of course, carbon prices have gone up and we enter a domain of abatement costs where you actually might see triggering of industrial decarbonization, where, however, the sensitivities around leakage and production and investment relocation ring at the same time now. And so the question is pointedly formulated, 
Do you think we're already seeing with current price levels, demand destruction or value chain reconfiguration being triggered by the carbon price, not only by future CCFDs, innovation fund, et cetera, but actually by the carbon price? Good one. Who wants to start? And again, it's just a quick one so we can, I mean, one could talk long about this. It's a, it's a great topic. But. Yeah, I, I think from uh, from my side, I guess it would be that um, obviously this this demand destruction, this uh, kind of wholesale or large scale carbon leakage is is clearly a risk uh, if these kinds of prices uh, persist. Um, and if the uh, you know, but uh, I guess the the point would be that um, uh, it's perhaps a little bit too early to see sort of widespread uh, evidence of that just yet. But nevertheless, I would say that um, you know it is it is obviously one. This is an issue that motivates you know a plef you know the 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 wider set of pack the, the wider package of measures that is needed to address the situation. It's on the energy side. What are the new? What's the new fuel and what's the new uh, uh, capacity mix in the future? Uh, it's about uh, the border adjustments. It's about handling the as I, as I've been mentioning the short and long term and and somehow working through the, both of these challenges to sort of emerge at the other end of this crisis with a, a functioning ETS, a stronger ETS, and with you know more technology options available that then will uh, you know so uh, that that will then serve Europe well in the future. I think that is. Um, these are just, you know, some of, and then the social dimension, as we have discussed as well. So I think this is highlighting that it's obviously a complex uh, area. It's a uh, multifaceted, and there are lots of moving parts that all interact. And I think this is, uh, I guess, uh, this is the, this is certainly a big challenge. I don't think we necessarily have seen a huge amount of evidence of this this risk materializing to date, but it's clearly something that is potentially present in the future, and it's something that needs to be. Uh, kept in mind when designing the, the policies and the measures needed. I would uh, totally agree to what Justin said, and I would take a step further. Uh, that is that we need a geopolitical strategy that is rethinking profoundly where we are in Europe now that Russia is taking another course. Um, you know, it goes much beyond oil and gas and coal. It also goes about the raw materials. And that's one element. The other element is which are the new partners that we are going to work with. Uh, we are now already seeing countries that we were hardly talking about by way of exaggeration. You know, in this context, we see the discussions with Egypt and Algeria and Namibia, apart from the Middle East and Oman and whatever. All these countries have come to the fore in as the fallout of what was happening uh, since uh, uh, February the 24th. And I think we need more of that. And the issue that comes to my mind is the idea that the German Chancellor has been advancing in the G7 context as a carbon club. Because, you know, these are the countries that we are targeting under a CBAM. So we try to make friends with them, you know, to have their imports of oil and gas and you know, alternative fuels and raw materials. And at the same time, we are telling them, if you export to us, we are going to have a border tariff you know, on some of the products you are going to, so, uh, to export to us. So we need a geopolitical strategy that is encompassing the CBAM into a kind of a much wider connotation, new forms of economic, industrial, technology cooperation, financing, transfer of technology, because we are living in a new world. Uh, we were gambling as a continent, big way on trade with Russia that is rich in energy resources and raw materials. But now the politics is what it is. And I think the trust has gone, which is the capital that has gone through the door. And so uh, we have to have a major rethink. And with the CBAM, we are only at the beginning of it. And we see the, the first exercise is coming, the first discussion in the G7 context, and we are going to need much more of that. So um, this is the beginning of a new journey, I think, um, that is going to determine whether we are going to live up to our climate targets or whether we are going to miss them. Let's face it, these targets are really demanding and the cheap options have gone. So we are living, you know, in terms of climate policy, in a quite a different world compared uh, to where we were before uh, February 24th. 
fantastic um, remarks, broadening the scope and importance, the scale. Maureen, of course, Korea is one of those partners. It has a carbon price, which already helps it anticipate and deal with this event. But how is the discussion in Korea, which is an industry, very industry focused, um, industry dependent country? Yes, um, uh, the CBAM is really a big issue in Korea right now. I mean, um, honestly speaking, C CBAM is really not very welcomed in Korea by the industries because it will cost a lot of money for them. Because if you compare our ETS prices, ours is really very, very low compared to the EUA prices. But there is hope and it might be, it's to our advantage to take, to take this in a long term that the CBAM might affect Korea's ETS by trying to encourage more transition, energy transition, low energy transition by industries so that we can adapt to the, to the CBAM regulations. Um, there is also, um, how do I call it? Um, there's also um, talks between many, many um, associations about um, trying to like, uh, uh, purge of partnerships with other countries, especially with the EU countries, so that they can have a more understanding of the, the CBAM. But yeah, basically at, at, at this very moment, CBAM is not very welcome, but we are having, we have to see it in the long term that it will be good for uh, having a common carbon price and probably it will also enable us to try to link with the EU ETS in the long term. So, yeah, let's wait and see. Hopefully, can go through. Well, what is for sure is it will be interesting times. I think that in fact, this last just this, these last five minutes, you know, herald a topic that deserves its own webinar: how to have a geopolitical strategy that, that fosters climate cooperation. But out of respect to our audience and our panelists, um, we are over time. I, I will close. It's. Uh, always with a heavy heart. I think we could have continued a long time. I want to thank, of course, the European Commission for supporting these uh, webinars, for my colleagues behind the scenes who were facilitating it, for the audience, for great questions, and most of all, for this excellent panel, for such thoughtful, you know, rich and, and thought-provoking um, discussions and interventions. As always, we encourage you to go to the website that Johnny has linked in the chat, ICAP hyphen training.eu where you will find the recording and the slides of today's webinar past previous webinars and of course announcements of future webinars and as i hinted earlier also future other outreach activities including hopefully soon in-person courses again we'd love of course to meet and see many in the audience in person at some point as well with that i'll close for today again thank you very much to everybody stay safe and I'm sure we'll see each other again in a future webinar. Take good care. Bye-bye.